All right, let's do this one last time. Spider-Man's debut with Marvel was in 1962. Since the Silver Age of comic books, the webhead has become a mainstay on the silver screen. Wherever you look, you are bound to find some version of Spider-Man. My name is Peter Parker. My name is Penny Parker. My name is Peter Parker. All right, thanks to Sony and the MCU, Spider-Man is almost inescapable. That man's an imposter. That man is the imposter. And it doesn't quite matter what the medium is. Spider-Man is everywhere. Look, I'm a comic book. I'm a serial. Did a Christmas album. I have an excellent theme song. Spider-Man. Spider-Man. And uh, a so-so popsicle. The most faithful adaptations are tailor-made to fit the mold of the character, while the readily forgotten adaptations are noticeably ill-fitting. Can I return it if it doesn't fit? It always fits. Eventually. Now, perhaps just as defining as Spider-Man's suits are the villains sat opposite the wall crawler. Just like a well-curated closet, Spider-Man's publishing house boasts a colorful gallery of rogues. Like a skin-tight cloth, the villains give shape to our hero, clinging to even the most intimate, vulnerable, uncomfortable parts of Peter, oftentimes portraying him in the least flattering way possible. Looks uncomfortable. It gets kind of itchy. It rides up in the crotch a little bit, too. No villain is more acquainted with this practice than Mysterio, a villain whose only threat lies in his illusions. But Mysterio is a counterfeit superhero, a fraudulent spider weaving a web of lies with shoddy web shooters. The great paradox of the villain is as plain as this. Mysterio is ensnared by the very trap he has laid out, deceived by his own illusions. You My are no match for the power of Mysterio. Implicit to every lie that Mysterio indulges is an imitation of the truth. A contrived authenticity that is as useful as it is useless. If you've ever attempted to deceive someone, you've attempted to make the unbelievable believable. In this cartoon, Mysterio doesn't need to be invisible, he just needs to convince the cops of the fact. Oh, now let's disappear. Nobody here. Come on. Not bad, Bubblehead. Not bad. And in Far From Home, Mysterio doesn't need to be a hero. He just needs Spider-Man and Nick Fury and 7 billion people to believe as much. It's easy to fool people when they're already fooling themselves. Now popular wisdom tells us that one lie always leads to another. So as the movie progresses, Mysterio creates an ecosystem of lies, an interconnected environment that hangs on a delicate balance. The villain was so committed to his performance that he even started to believe his own lies. I control the truth! Mysterio is the truth! If we're being honest, when we lie, we like to think that we are arbiters of the truth, able to convince our audience that what they are seeing is real. The problem is that we end up conflating fantasy and reality for ourselves just as much as our audience. It can be easy to forget that lies are born out of powerlessness. We reach for something that we shouldn't have because something happened to us that shouldn't have. Remember, this all started because Tony Stark made Quentin Beck feel powerless. He renamed my life's work, Barf. I told him it was a mistake, that my technology could change the world. And then, he fired me. But these days, you can be the smartest guy in the room, the most qualified, and no one cares. But rather than confront this sobering reality, Beck obliges and gets drunk off his own power fantasy. Now in contrast, Spider-Man learns the lesson of responsibility through those around him. That's what's at stake here. Not choice, responsibility. This idea of communal accountability is most visible in the way that Uncle Ben's death amplifies his iconic advice. Remember, with great power comes great responsibility. After all, Peter blames himself for Uncle Ben's death. But as if we were tracing a web to the corner of a building, pulling the thread of Uncle Ben's death lands our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man amongst his community in, well, a neighborhood. If you'll recall, Uncle Ben's advice had no traction at first. I'll figure it out. Stop lecturing me, please. I don't mean to lecture and I don't mean to preach. 
And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. Peter was actually more influenced by the sleazy wrestling announcer who figuratively robbed him of the $3,000 he won. I need that money. I missed the part where that's my problem. So in turn, he allows the announcer to get literally robbed. You could have taken that guy apart. Now he's going to get away with my money. I missed the part where that's my problem. Then, as the tragedy goes, it becomes his problem because this gunman becomes an accomplice to Uncle Ben's killer. Mistakes are not easily forgotten. Though they beget shame and guilt, they are just as responsible for shaping the people we become as any heroic feat we accomplish. And regrets accounted for, I think it's poetic that the announcer is the one who stumbles across the name Spider-Man. The Amazing Spider-Man! Notice how Peter negotiates with the announcer in much the same way that he negotiates with Uncle Ben. My name's the Human Spider. I don't care, get out there. No, you got my name wrong. Get you out there, you moron. And I know I'm not your father. Then stop pretending to be. And this shows how both men shape the hero. A wise teacher like Uncle Ben is rendered useless with a proud student. And salvaging value from a cruel teacher requires humility and patience all the more. We don't always get to choose our teachers. No doubt, Peter laments the influence that the announcer and the gunman had on his life. But we do get to choose the lessons we learn. Wait! Wait, the tablet! No, it could still be mine! It could still- Some guys never learn. All this to say, it's fitting that Mysterio takes the shape of a power-crazed villain as his thirst for power and ultimate mishandling of it reaffirms Uncle Ben's advice that With great power comes great responsibility. Whereas Spider-Man embraces pain, though sometimes reluctantly so, Mysterio recoils from it. The villain lacks Doc Ock's genius-level intellect and instead possesses a blinding wisdom. Paradoxically, he's humble enough to know that he lacks any real power, but is too proud to sit in this truth. Ah, yes, power. This is what real power feels like. No more parlor tricks and sleight of hand. It can be easy to vilify Mysterio, right? But I question whether we have more in common with the charlatan than we do with Spider-Man. After years of pretending, of faking my way with special effects and stage magic, to have a taste of the real thing. We all covet real power, or at least, we resent weakness. So often, we strive towards excellence because we want others to believe we truly are excellent. But like a clammy magician, we are afraid that other people will catch on to our parlor tricks. We can't break through walls like Rhino, so instead, we bang our head against the wall of our own ego. We can't control the elements like Sandman, so instead, we pine for the things we can control. As with Green Goblin, we have a darker, more conniving self lurking beneath even our most virtuous actions. I've watched you from deep behind Norman's cowardly eyes, struggling to have everything you want while the world tries to make you choose. And perhaps most damning of all is our connection to Lizard. We are so worried that others would read our weaknesses as deformities, so worried that our weaknesses would dehumanize us, that we mistake self-sabotage for self-medication and dehumanize ourselves before anyone else can. Literary conventions respecting, good foil characters mirror a protagonist in more ways than one, forcing the main character to reflect on who they truly are. Mysterio goes one step further forcing us to reflect on our own character and question where our power truly lies.